You know, I was uh, excited when uh, Hope asked me to talk about this topic of what is the importance of data. Um, you know, those people who know me know that I'm not a man with a lot of answers, but this is a question that I feel like I definitely can answer. So what is the importance of data? Well, data has no importance, at least not by itself. When I was in graduate school, it was drilled into my head that data is only useful if it informs decision making. So, you know, there's lots of cool analytic techniques that you know, we've heard some uh, about that, and I'm sure there's a lot of people smarter than me who are going to be talking about sort of various types of ways that you can analyze data, but I wanted to step back and instead focus on two data prerequisites. So before we're getting big data sets or small data, um, before any of that, first you want to think about sort of selecting data points, um, and then two, assigning value to that data. How do we sort of assign our own um, sort of personal value? How are we going to interpret that? So first, uh, to talk about selecting data points. Now, selecting data points is difficult in the social sector because a lot of data points are proxies. And when I'm talking about data points in this talk, I'm going to be specifically talking about sort of social outcomes metrics or outcomes data. So for example, maybe we care about education, but then we track graduation rates. Graduation rates isn't exactly education. We kind of use it as a proxy as to whether someone is educated or not. Or maybe we care about economic independence, and then we're tracking job placements. Again, this isn't necessarily exactly the same thing. So tracking the wrong data points can lead to the wrong decisions. So uh, here's an example of a, uh, a organization that invests in community development corporations that I worked with. And uh, one of the things they cared about was uh, crime reduction. Um, and so the way that they were deciding where to uh, invest in uh, sort of anti-crime programs was in areas that had high arrest rates. And so they brought me in to help them uh, with an evaluation strategy. And so, you know, okay, so they care about crime reduction, but presumably another thing that they cared about was also do people feel safe in the neighborhoods that they're investing in. So the way we tracked that was public perception surveys. So we just went into these communities and asked people, okay, do you feel safe here in these places where this organization is making its investments? And what we found was that people felt safer in the higher arrest areas. So the way that this organization was making its investment decisions was using this objective function on the left, that it was trying to minimize the arrest rates. And what we found was that minimizing the arrest rates did not correlate to maximizing feeling safe. When we went into the communities and asked people why, what we found is in these low-income areas, people had lost confidence in the police departments. So they simply stopped reporting the crimes. The police weren't coming around. So arrests was a poor proxy for crime, right? And so for people feeling safe. And the end result of that is this organization was actually investing its anti-crime interventions in the wrong areas. It's a pretty significant mistake. Secondly, focusing on the wrong indicators can actually lead to negative but rational decisions. So here's another example of a workforce development program. Um, I was talking to them. Uh, you know, they said, hey, you know, um, we're funded by the state of California. That's our funder. Um, and uh, you know, this funder wants us uh, to maximize job placements. So how do we do that? And I said, well, you, know, you don't need to hire me, pay me a bunch of money to do that. I can tell you very simply how to maximize job placements. You already know how to do it. All you have to do is minimize the hard to serve people, right? This isn't what the organization wanted to do. This isn't what the funder intended. But the funder chose an indicator and this objective function to maximize job placements that rationally would lead this organization to, in order to sort of fulfill that uh, top objective function, is to implement this one here on the bottom. That's a pretty significant issue. So how do we kind of deal with this? Um, so I think the way that we kind of approach this is what I talk about, um, sort of assigning value to data. Um, so, so before diving into the data, we need to be explicit about our own utility frameworks. What I mean by utility framework is the way that we sort of ascribe value to the data points, sort of to these outcomes metrics. So you know, in the examples we've been looking at is these very simplistic utility frameworks where you're sim simply maximizing one particular indicator. This is overly simplistic. Now, a utility framework is sort of how we value data points, including the interaction between these data points. 
So uh, I've got to model it out. Basically, uh, you have this vector of a bunch of data points, and then you have sort of this utility function. So you put a bunch of data points into that, and then that, uh, based upon the data that goes in there, sort of determine you know, how happy we are um, with that uh, cocktail of outcomes. Um, and so uh, instead of sort of maximizing job placements or whatever the case, instead we want to be maximizing over our utility framework. So in that jobs example, we might not just be thinking about job placements, but you know, how difficult is it to place these individuals into jobs? Uh, how long have they been out of the labor market? Sort of taking all of that into account. And then we want to maximize over that. So the vulnerability index is a good real world example uh, of a utility framework. And this comes out of homeless services, out of the housing first movement. Um, and so what the vulnerability index does, is it tries to prioritize people um, based upon how likely they are to die on the street. And so give those people preference for moving into housing. So this function takes into account um, the number of months an individual has been on the street, how old that individual is, uh, mental and, uh, and physical health, and sort of other factors. And so it's not just focusing on, okay, place people into housing, or work with clients uh, who in order to, you know, again, it's sort of the same issue as the workforce development problem. If you want to sort of maximize housing placements, just work with the people who are easiest to serve. This is a lot more nuanced, where now you're prioritizing the people who are the most chronically homeless, and your utility framework actually reflects that. So without establishing an organization and utility framework, um, everyone makes decisions according to their own values. I was working with a foundation where um, they're investing in arts, but then they're also investing in crime, they're investing in various types of community development programs, and everyone is just kind of making their decisions based upon whatever their own personal utility framework is. And so the problem is that if you have different utility functions and the same data, then you can have different decisions. This is the reason that we have Republicans and Democrats. We have the same data, but you have two different utility frameworks, and so then you lead to different decisions. So how do we model a utility framework? Well, there's some precedent for how to do that. So utility elicitation is fairly common in the business world, specifically focused at sort of higher level executives. Um, and the basic process is that uh, you model a decision maker's risk reward preference through a series of hypothetical investment scenarios. And so you're trying to find sort of these points of indifference and you can model out in various types of investment, decision, investment scenarios what this decision maker likely would choose to do in that situation. So you know, the key to this utility elicitation process is finding these points of indifference. And so let's bring it back uh, to a social sector example. Um, you know, we may find that for an individual organization, housing one chronically homeless person is equivalent to placing three job-ready people into jobs. And so what's cool about this is that now we can think about uh, sort of housing chronically homeless people in terms of placing people into jobs, and we can think about placing people into jobs in terms of housing, people, uh, of, uh, housing chronically homeless individuals. So these points of indifference allow us to compare unlike uh, indicators. And this can be particularly uh, powerful for foundations that have mixed investment portfolios. So developing a utility framework enforces consistent investment decisions sort of within an organization. Uh, it makes investment priorities clear. Um, and I think most importantly, uh, by making it clear, making uh, sort of investment priorities transparent, uh, they can be tested and refined through time. Um, so sort of to sum it up, before diving into data, first, uh, select uh, likely a series of data points that approximate what we actually care about. Um, and second, uh, build out a model that assigns value to data points and then update that model through time. Okay. Great. <laughs> David, thank you. Questions? I have a question to start, which might not be an easy one, but <laughs> what is the most widely used public utility framework that you see is the most flawed, the most flawed public utility framework? Wow, that's not an easy one. <laughs> uh, and might get me into trouble also. Um, you know, I don't know if I can necessarily say sort of a, a most used one. I mean, I think that the example of uh, the state of California funder and workforce development I mean, that's fairly common. I, mean, uh, I know I have another client uh, where Housing Urban Development Department uh, is doing the same thing um, through a stream for uh, placing people uh, into housing uh, where the rational thing to do is to kick out all the chronically homeless people, just sort of screen for people who are likely to get evicted. 
um, and just bring in the people who are otherwise cyclically homeless and would have sort of found housing within you know, two weeks or a month on their own anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of examples like that. Mm -hmm. And are there any in particular for, that you think foundations could play a particular role in resolving or helping to become more rational? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, the, the failure in, uh, in those examples is to not think through to the logical conclusion as to what is the way to sort of best optimize over uh, the utility framework that the funder was putting out there. Um, I mean, it's a fairly simple mental exercise to say, okay, well, how would you maximize placing people into jobs? Well, only serve the people who are likely to get into the jobs. A more nuanced approach would provide, uh, you know, maybe just even simply just taking the two inputs of job placement and months out of the workforce, and then uh, valuing more people who have been out of the workforce longer getting job placements. And that simple change um, would help sort of get around that issue that I talked about in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, so what you presented seems, it sounds so logical. And um, when you think about the state of um, decision making in nonprofits or in government, it necess doesn't necessarily follow this logic. So wh where do you think, what's the gap? Why, is there, why are these tools not more um, or better um, utilized? Right. I think that in the social sector, there's a lot of lamenting about how we don't have a profit counterpart, that we look at sort of our business peers and say, hey, you guys are all optimizing over profit. That's awesome. We want to have this one thing to optimize over. Also, what is that one objective measure? Um, I think the fallacy in there is that profit or sort of money uh, has this illusion of being objective, but it's not, right? I mean, we all value money in different ways. More importantly, we have sort of different risk reward preferences around that. So every company has its own utility framework sort of based around this sort of clearer outcome of profit. I think in the social sector, instead of sort of chasing after sort of what is this objective metric, is first we have to accept that there is inherently subjectivity in any investment decisions. And so this utility framework uh, that I lay out here is sort of a way of embracing that subjectivity uh, and then trying to sort of place the values therein. Have you looked at the pay for success model? No. Okay. We, maybe we could talk about it offline. Because okay. it's, okay. a, it's a methodology that more governments are looking at mm -hmm. um, and um, it relies on having data that, like Housing First, for example, as an intervention, can save government a lot of money because mm. um, it's preventing. Oh, these are like the impact bonds. Social right. impact okay. bonds. Right, right. Yes. Same so, game, different name. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Um, so, any thought about the use of this model in that kind of application? Yeah, no, I think it would. Uh, I think it's perfectly applicable there. I mean, sort of the idea is that you can use that for. Any modeling. I mean, I, I wish I'd come up with something cool, but I don't think I did. It's you know we're doing this in the business world all the time. It's just sort of applying that and putting in sort of social sector uh, inputs rather than just profit. So yeah, perfectly applicable. So you mentioned that the um, framework really embraces the bias paradigm, right? right? And sort of says, hey, these are the, the factors that we think are, are important. And you, you seek that sort of indifference equilibrium where you're, you, you know, the three, um, your example of um, three homeless, I'm sorry, uh, the right. three for one. Yeah. <laughs> but the, but the <laughs> theory the is one, yeah. that, you know, that that is really biased. I mean, and it really does not embrace sort of the rational sort of econometric, like what is the real value? And sort of I'm, I'm just getting back to the, you know, the whole discussion around exchange and, and impact bonds. A, we can build, you know, sort of the, the logical problems that you articulated, which are, you know, take the, har the least hard and make those good and then declare victories. That's sort of one problem that we know is, you know, sort of the creaming problem. And then the second is that um, we still don't have really an, an optimized perspective around what would be the best thing to do, right? Because it's still, you're sort of baking in the bias. So I'm curious, you know, as to your thoughts around that. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the way that I think about it is sort of the, the output 
of that, that utility model yeah. that, I mean, you're bringing up the idea of sort of econometric modeling, that becomes the why. That's sort of the outcome that you're looking towards, right? And so then it, sort of these various other types of sort of independent variables, what you're trying to do is sort of optimize over that, that outcome, which is, you know, this, you know, everything that goes into that utility model. So, you know, at any point, you know, if you're putting together an econometric model or a machine learning model or whatever, I mean, it, it all initially starts with the subjective decision of what is it that you value. All I'm proposing here is uh, sort of a way of sort of modeling out uh, what that thing is that you're trying to optimize over. David, in your practical experience, how, how complex are those utility models? Do you, you, you end up or have you learned to, oh, after 10 variables, it just gets too complicated and there's too much, you know, the variance gets too small for each of those? Or do you have any practical advice to us if we're trying to replicate something like that? Yeah, and so, you know, and the, the way that I've sort of used this utility model, modeling is as a continuum. I've had sort of some clients that uh, really sort of embrace sort of fully sort of modeling out. Um, but even in the cases where I'm not, I use this sort of more as a theoretical framework to kind of guide the discussion, so to try to create sort of some boundaries around decision making so that investments aren't just based upon sort of the whims of every individual within that agency. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm remembering decision sciences kind of uh, <laughs> belatedly. And, and um, would, and, and so I'm, I'm just, just to understand the difference between like an objective function and the utility framework. I mean, would, would the US News college rankings, does that involve a utility framework? Are the coefficients that they use in their models yeah. really reflective of uh, some, someone's utili right. utility analysis? Yeah, it, it's a really bad utility framework, but yeah. <laughs> So that's a ubiquitous one, mm -hmm. right? It's, the, the that, maybe that's the yeah, worst. Yeah, very right? much so. <laughs> I, I was aiming for something like a national poverty ranking, you know, <laughs> but that is that one is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I think Diego, had you had a question? Yeah, I, uh, I wonder uh, what is the best success story you can think of where uh, social sector company applied this. And then how do they go? Do they start when they start a project or when they start the, they, they, they think about all this and then how do they follow up and then how, I mean, everybody here, I, I guess, agrees what you've shown is fantastic. I would love to see that in every social sector project, right? But then we get to reality and then how many of those can implement this? What's the level of effort they have to put into implementing something like right. this? How should they follow up to make a success out of doing this? Right. And I wonder, if you could name one or two, and then how do they engage, when do you engage, how do you follow up, and how do they make this a success story? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that sort of where an organization gets the most value out of this process is really at the initial stage, where sort of everyone, you know, first uh, what I do is sort of have everyone um, sort of go through an exercise where we model out their individual utility framework, and then sort of get everybody in a room, and they realize, oh, holy crap, we all think completely different things. We have sort of different utility models. Um, and then from there, go through a process of trying to sort of line all of that up. And so already at that point, sort of now you've created uh, sort of some sort of coherent vision for that organization. Um, in terms of uh, sort of how do you uh, sort of update that model and sort of think about it through time, I, now you have this model that sort of creates some sort of boxed in thinking. So everyone, all the investment decisions are kind of going through that. If there is an investment that we want to make and we think otherwise, hey, you know, this is a really good thing, but it doesn't fit the model, the idea is not to say, oh, well, we can't do that because it doesn't fit the model, but instead to look at the model and say, okay, well, you know, what is it that we're valuing about this other investment opportunity, and how do we sort of modify the model therein? Um, and so then sort of through time, as you're applying data and kind of pushing data sort of through that, um, through that model, um, it, you can kind of validate it by saying, okay, well, here's these investments that I would want to make, and I would prioritize these, these way. Does the model sort of, you know, fit that or not, and if it doesn't, then you recalibrate it.
Sure. This feels very movable for many of the organizations you end up working with. Yeah, I mean, so a, you know, a more concrete example is uh, a funding entity I was working with um, that does make investments in arts programs and in uh, safety, right? I mean, these are two very disparate things, or how do you compare them? Um, and so they had a set of indicators that uh, they cared about um, for arts programs, and they had a set of indicators that they care about for the public safety, and when you sort of put those inputs in for one investment opportunity for a safe, let's say you have to make it more concrete. So let's say that you know, two investment uh, possibilities come in. You can only invest in one of the two of them, right? How do you compare the safety program to the arts program? Well, since they already had a model for how they value arts in terms of safety and then therefore safety in terms of arts, they can put sort of both of the sort of expected outcomes of each of those two programs into the model and then you literally get a score and you can say, okay, well, according to our framework, then we would invest in the arts intervention in this case over the safety intervention or vice versa. Any other questions? So, so this is a little bit um, along the same vein as Buzz, the idea of this of a utility framework being something that essentially is a, is a kind of a bell jar, mm. if you will. It says, okay, we have an intervention and we wanna find out if it's working. And it's starting from the place of, of kind of valuing and providing a utility framework for the intervention itself. And do you, have you seen anything that says, okay, let's just put the bell jar aside for a moment. Let's look at the whole sea of data and let the data speak about what is actually being successful in, in outside of the realm of the intervention itself, beyond you know, the boundaries right. of, of the program or the investment, and start surfacing the things that look like actually they're succeeding, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to you know, the kind of starting from the particular and going right. to the general or whatever it is. Have yeah. you seen that out there? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the difficulty is, is again, that I mean, in every investment situation, at some point, you're making sort of some type of subjective judgment. I mean, if you just want to think about sort of, OK, you know, I want to invest in the thing that is most successful, right? I mean, then we should probably be investing in Chevron, right? I mean, that's sort of most successful by many metrics. Or if you think about like sort of profit as your metric, right? But if profit isn't the metric that you care about, and instead you care about some type of social outcome, then that's gonna change you know, the framing in which you sort of think about success. Um, so I think before we can say like, okay, we'll just think about a data, bunch of data points and have that data determine what is most successful, we have to have some type of modeling as to what success to us actually or, means. Or the data itself might suggest a new utility framework. I, I don't know how it would do that. Well, well it, you know, it shows you things that you didn't expect to find. But you have to either value or not value those things that the model finds. Well, then right? that's, that seems to me to be the second step. Well, if you started with data, I mean, what data points? I guess I don't know what data points you start with then, because then you could start with sort of everything in the universe, presumably. Well, according to Amanda, you can't start <laughs> with everything in the universe. <laughs> That's, I mean, I guess I'm saying to myself, if I, my, my observation with, with foundations is there's yeah. a tendency to be precious. Mm -hmm. about our world and, and live in a terrarium or a bell jar or whatever and to say we are going to do this special program and it's going to help people get out of homelessness. Well, let's, let's look at what's happening with homeless people general, you know, more generally. Okay. Yeah, I, I, what you're saying. I mean, I think that the point is, is that the utility modeling is at the point where you decide uh, that what outcomes you care about for those homeless individuals. And then it, certainly you, you can use this framework to evaluate nonprofit interventions as well as investing in housing developers or whatever the case. There's nothing about the framework that would exclude any interventions. What it is is a way of modeling out sort of what are the outcomes that you're expecting or sort of wanting to see. Or investing in a real estate investment company sure. that actually houses more homeless yeah, people. Yeah, according to <laughs> nonprofit in the whole world. Yeah, if that organization is better at achieving, uh, you know, at maximizing your utility function, then it would be consistent with the utility model to invest in that organization over uh, sort of a nonprofit program. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Great. I want to make sure that we have time for Sarah's talk, um, but I know that David's going to be around during the break, and so you can ask him your questions at that time or later over the next day and a half. 
David, thank you very much. Right. <laughs>